Well, we have been working through a series. Um, last week we started called Sibling Rivalry. We talked about how rivalry is the, the desire to win, to, to be supreme, to get on top, to, to be victorious over. And we live in this world in which people want to uh, always be the winners, and that makes there be losers, and, and that we're always in this conflict and struggle. And we looked last week at some of the factors and challenges that, that kind of are already in the water, that are already in the atmosphere before you even get to uh, us making bad decisions that make the situation even worse. Um, but we talked about how people use God and use the Bible and, and use theology um, to kind of always make sure that they say that God is on their side and the other side says God's on our side and, and that we struggle together in the midst of that and, and that there are people who, who play favorites, there are people uh, who are withholding of their love, that there are people uh, who have kind of this privilege like Esau last week and, and he didn't even realize that this birthright maybe had some animosity towards him from his brother. And so in the midst of that kind of scarcity world in which we're fighting with each other for that limited amount of love, that limited amount of blessing and hope, um, there is a breeding ground for some bad, destructive behavior. And we'll get a little bit of a, a reminder of this early on as we set the scene in this story today, as we continue with Esau and Jacob and, and their parents, Isaac and Rebecca. And... This is a, a longer story, and we're going to try to read through um, good portions of it as we go through. Uh, but it's a reminder that our, our Scripture is so wonderfully uh, powerful and speaks to real-life pains and struggles, and even the characters that we think are supposed to be the heroes are often doing some things that, uh, that are not meant to be modeled. And so there's a realness to this text that's valuable to sit with, and in a way, there are some things that the story says that are powerful on their own um, that, that sometimes don't even need commentary. They're just powerful. And so we, we start the scene this morning with a little request from Isaac of his son Esau. And this little request is going to unravel. And so I'm going to start with Genesis 27, verses 1 through 4, and uh, we'll hear the occasion of this story today. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he couldn't see, he called his elder son Esau and he said to him, my son, and he answered, here I am. And he said, see, I'm old and I don't know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow and go out into the field and hunt game for me. Then prepare for me savory food such as I like and bring it to me to eat, so that I may bless you before I die. And this seems like kind of an innocuous moment of like, oh, this is, you know, little old Isaac. He just wants that last meal. You know, he just wants that favorite dish, and he's hungry, and he's longing for it. And so he has a request. Hey, Esau, would you go out to the field uh, you're great at that. We read last week Esau is the guy that's always out in the field and he's hunting and he, he gets favor and love from his dad because of what he brings him to eat. And so, would you go get me some food so that I might bless you? And I want to point out that we might just run past that because Jacob and, and his mom are going to kind of do some mischievous, de uh, deceptive things later in the story and we're going to spend all of our energy thinking about that. But this story is already set up to be a struggle and to be a conflict. And like we said last week, uh, Isaac's not calling both sons together of, hey, I want to bless you both. I want to bless my oldest son. And he's not just saying, I wanna, I, I'm realizing I'm, I'm up there in years. I don't know when I might die. Before I die, I want to give you a blessing. He wants some strings attached, some conditional statements. You know that meal I love? If you bring me that meal, I will bless you. And I think about just kind of the sadness of that reality, just to start, of how many people, you know, we, we kind of have this idea, and, and maybe you remember it from a few weeks back when, when Brian was here from uh, ABC of Michigan, and he talked about, we have a lot of like 30-year, first-year Christians, of you've been a first-year Christian for so long, that we just sometimes assume, well, of course, I'm, I'm more mature in my faith than I was five years ago, 10 years, 30 years, 50 years ago. But here's Isaac at the end of his life, 
still being conditional with the blessings. You know, if you give me what I want, I'll give you that blessing that you want. And think about going to your, to your deathbed and still having that kind of controlling grasp and still not being as generous of wanting to give that blessing to everybody in your life. It's still just to the one you want to favorite. Um, and so uh, I, I think that it's helpful maybe to, to see two categories. Uh, one, of, uh, one of friends of mine, uh, Richard Crane, who is a professor at Messiah College, he talks about the kind of dilemma that people are often villains and victims. You are often hurt. You are often harmed. You are often uh, you know, mistreated and, and into a system in which has pushed you in some, some terrible ways. But we often end up perpetuating that system. We end up taking the harm that was put on us and pushing it on to somebody else. And so, yeah, Isaac's going to get duped in this story. He's going to get tricked. He's going to be mistreated. He's going to be lied to. But he's also not a perfect person. He also is withholding and he's, he's fueling this toxic dynamic in this family. Uh, and, and that doesn't make him fully villain, fully victim. It's the messiness in the middle of that. But he gives this request. Hey, I'd love some food. Esau, can you go give me that food and I'll bless you. Esau exits the scene. We'll get to Esau at the end. Uh, but there's some other family dynamics that we have to get to before we get to the full Jacob and Esau and their relationship. You see, Genesis 27 verse 5 says, Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. How much trouble we get sometimes when we're just eavesdropping, just listening in. Uh, it, it wasn't my conversation to be had, it, but you know what? If I'm listening in on somebody else's thing, and I start kind of butting my, in, my way into their conversations, their dilemmas, their challenges. And so Rebecca inserts herself into this of, okay, I hear what Isaac wants to do. I'm going to get involved. And so she goes to her son that she loves. Last week we read Isaac loves Esau, and the hunter, and, Re and Rebecca loves Jacob. And so she goes to Jacob, and she comes up with a plan. She says to uh, Jacob... Uh, he says, she says to Jacob, I heard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game and prepare for me some savory food to eat that I might bless you before the Lord and before I die. Now, therefore, my son, Jacob, obey my word as I command you. Go to the flock, give me the two choice uh, kids, the goats, so that I may prepare for them, for him, savory food for your father such as he likes, and you shall take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. So Rebecca thinks she's got a great plan. She's like, okay, I hear Isaac really wants to bless Esau. He's gone. He's going to go try to hunt. Well, we've got some goats out back. Jacob, go get the goats. Bring them to me. I'll make the meal real fast, and you can bring them to your dad so he'll bless you before he dies. I appreciate in this text that Jacob pauses and he notes that this isn't what he should do. He's going to go along with it, but he pauses to be like, what happens if I get caught? That's not the words of an innocent person. <laughs> You're not usually thinking, I'm going to go help someone. I'm going to go make a meal for my dad. But what if he catches me? Jacob knows this is not the right kind of path, and he inv invites Rebecca to figure out with him, but, but what happens if we're caught? And he says there, uh, perhaps my father, uh, he, I love this phrasing, uh, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a man of smooth skin. Perhaps my father will feel me, he'll touch me, and, I'll, and I shall seem to him to be mocking him and bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. So he admits if I go through with this, I'm mocking my father. I'm acting like I'm someone I'm not. I'm acting like he can't figure that out. I'm, I'm not giving him honor. I'm shaming him. What if I do that and he figures it out and he curses me instead of blesses me? So what if this all falls flat? What if this just falls in our face and we, we lose out here? And Rebecca tells him, I'll take the brunt of this. Here's how she says that she will act. She says, 
Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my word and go get them for me. And she's gonna have some more plans of what to do. You know what? You can trust me. Go do this thing you know you shouldn't do. I'll take the brunt of it. I'll take the, the curse. Uh, I'll take the blame. Does it, do you know anybody in your life who's ever kind of, maybe you think about your childhood years of someone who's kind of egged you on of, hey, go do this. Go take that thing from the teacher's desk or whatever it is. Don't worry. I'll, I'll take the blame. And once things go bad, they're nowhere to be found. Like, Rebecca's not actually going to take the blame at the end of the story. She's going to find a new, another way to scheme and, and try to figure out, which we'll look at next week, of what's the plan to, to survive another day. But at the end of the story, when everyone's been duped, uh, Isaac's going to say, what has Jacob done? And Esau's going to be upset. And no one, you don't see this story of Rebecca showing up saying, hey guys, sorry, it was my idea. I'll take the curse. And then you're gone. There's no taking of it. Of how many people are like talked into doing something they know is wrong, and that person does it thinking, you know what, I'm just following orders. And we know that kind of phrasing from moments of dark moments in human history in which people are asked, how did you take part in this ugly, terrible thing? Well, I was just following orders. And Isaac can just say that same thing. Rebecca said, hey, obey what I say to you. I'll take the curse. And Jacob goes through with it and says, okay, fine. I'll, I'll do what you ask. And he's willing to, to shame his father. He's willing to steal and to kind of mislead and be deceptive, not just to his father, but to his brother. All because of, of what he will gain and maybe the hope that maybe his mom will take the brunt of the curse and the, the punishment if something goes bad. You know, they never actually plan ahead to what happens if this is successful and that there's still consequences. Uh, the kind of schemes only kind of end at like, well, what if he catches me in the moment? Uh, because they think getting that blessing in that moment is worth any long-term consequences. And I think there's a lot of people who struggle with, does the ends justify the means? If I get what I want, will all of this be worth it? And Rebecca and Jacob go on that path. And they go on a path uh, that's going to lead to, there's, there's no coming back from it. And so Rebecca tells him, go, you know, you get the goats. Yeah, we're going to cook the meat, but we're also going to take some of the fur because you said you're not a hairy man. And we're going to strategically place it around you so that if, if your dad touches you, he might feel the, the hair and think, oh, this is Esau. And go get Esau's favorite clothes and go dr be dressed like him. So if he feels the clothes or, or if he smells the scent of those clothes, that he will think you are your brother. And so Jacob goes through with this plan, and he keeps walking to the edge. And there are those moments in our life where we do something you just can't turn back from. Like someone has said something so hurtful to you that no matter what healing looks like for you, it's still a part of your story. If someone like betrayed you, they, they, they stabbed you in the back, that you might find some sort of healing but that's still always going to be a part of your story that you've had this ugly moment and that you've had to heal from an ugly moment. And maybe you've heard those words used at you. Maybe someone has physically hurt you. Um, maybe you might reflect on the ways that you have done those things, where you lashed out in anger with your speech or with your, with your physicalness, and that things will never be the same, even if they're healed it will always be a part of your story. And Jacob finds himself walking further and further to that point, right? Like he's had to go get the goats. It's not like he's not thinking about it. He's got to be thinking about, is this going to work? What's going to happen? Brings the goats in, his mom's cooking, and he's got to mull it over of, am I doing the right thing? Or is this going to work out? And he's getting his brother's clothes and putting them on. They probably fit pretty close. We don't know. Uh, well, I guess, guess we can say we, we know that they're probably not identical twins with the hair situation. Uh, but they're twins, and we, we sometimes forget when we talk about the older and the younger brother that we're talking not a lot of time on that age difference. But he's trying to put on his brother's clothes. He's trying to act like he's his older brother. And then you've got to actually walk up and approach someone. And if you've ever, like, done the wrong thing, you know how scary that feeling is, that guilt that's 
creeping in of like, oh no, I'm going to be found. I'm an imposter. And he walks closer and closer to his father. And if you think about the pain that Jacob's had in his life, because he doesn't necessarily know his father loves him and like he loves Esau. And he's putting on the persona of his brother of maybe my father will love me and he'll bless me. And he's, he's walking into the situation, showing up to his father. And his father has a lot of doubts. Like, there's kind of a humor to this, too, in the midst of the tragedy, that the dad keeps asking questions, keeps like, are you sure? And he kind of lets on that this situation doesn't feel right. And gives Jacob more and more opportunities to admit, yeah, it's, the charade's over. Uh, and he continually chooses not to do that. But here's how he walks into his dad's presence. He went to his father and said, My father, here I am. And his, uh, his dad says, Here I am. Who are you, my son? And there's been so much commentary built on that phrasing. Who are you, my son? Because later when Esau comes back, he'll just say, Who are you? Who are you, my son? Assumes he only has two guesses. <laughs> He's like, wait, I I hear that voice. Who are you, my son? And he says, I am Esau, your firstborn. Think about like just the pain of like that lie of like he's having to voice it. He's been living it out. He's got to say it out loud. I am Esau. And maybe you've found yourself trying to be somebody else and you've tried to wear their clothes, you've tried to put on their persona and you've tried to say it out loud. And you say it enough that you actually believe it. Uh, But he wants to be his brother. He wants his brother's blessing so bad he's going to even lie. I'm your Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you found it so quickly, my son? That's like the parent radar going off. You know, if you've ever wondered, like, how does my mom always know I'm up to no good here? (laughs) And it's those questions of, like, the time time schedule does not make sense here. You know, you're supposed to go hunting and then make the meal and come here. How did you get it so quickly, my son? And he says, because the Lord your God granted me success. Invoking God here. God has blessed me. That's how I'm here so fast. And how quickly we are to invoke God's name and whatever corrupt, less than activities that we do in life. Not just I've messed up, but hey, you know, God's blessing me in this. Hey, now I want your blessing too. The Lord, your God, granted me success. And I always kind of wonder about that of your God. As Jacob still wrestles and struggles to get to the point of saying my God. And then Isaac says to Jacob, come near that I might feel you, my son to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. Like, he's got a lot of questions, right? Come here, come so I can touch you. And so Jacob went up to his father, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So he clearly knows there's something weird. Maybe he can't get himself to believe what his son's doing here. Of like, you know the people who just don't want to see the worst in somebody, of who will just be like, no, I, I, you know, the people that fall victims to the scams, and particularly scams of those close to them, of like, I, they're just, there would never be a way that they would ever do that, right? It's like, well, I hear Jacob's voice, but I feel Esau. And so he goes on. He says, he didn't recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's Esau, so he blessed him. And then it says that his dad says again, are you really my son Esau? So again, last, last check. Can you go to the edge? Will you go all the way? Are you sure? Are you my son Esau? And Jacob says, I am. And think about how many times if you're at least willing to hear the voice of God or the voice of other people in your life who are saying, you're getting close to the edge. Are you sure this is the right path? Are you sure this is what you want to do? Are you sure this is uh, what God wants you to do? And maybe you need to hear God, like God saying in your head, or, or, and you can change the name to who you need it to say, but are you really my son Esau? 
we kind of put this on like teenagers and college age people, but it's actually true of all of us, of people who want to be somebody else, who want to take on that persona, who want to live someone else's way of life or whatever it is. And like, are you really, Esau, who are you? Are you that thing you're trying to act as or are you going to be yourself? Can you be authentic? Can you be honest? Can you be real with me? Are you really my son Esau? And he answered, I am. And so Isaac said, bring to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank and his father said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. Again, closer and closer and closer. I can touch so that I might kiss And at the kiss, he smells the garments of his son Esau on his son Jacob, and he blesses him, and he goes on to give this blessing. So uh, when you kind of, we always think of like betrayed with kisses and that kind of like Judas imagery, but like his father kisses his son, smells the scent of the other brother, and that kind of is the final like, okay, I can give this blessing. I trust that this is actually Esau, and he's not going to think it's Jacob. And he gives the blessing. And to remember the villain victim challenge, he gives him this blessing that other people are going to serve him and that even his sibling will serve him. And it's this kind of hierarchical view and and opportunity that's invoked in this blessing. And Jacob completes this, this, did the ends justify the means? He went through with this dark task and leaves the room feeling like, I got what I wanted, I got my blessing. And the text is almost comical of like, again, in the tragedy, that it's like just as he leaves, Esau shows up. You know, and and Esau shows up and he's like, here I am, Dad, I got your food. And and Isaac's like, who are you? Again, not necessarily wanting to believe that what has just happened has happened to him. And he says, I am your firstborn Esau. And then it says, Isaac trembled violently. Jacob's sin has consequences, whether it's just consequences on him, but like it harms his dad and it harms his brother. His dad feels the betrayal. He feels the the, the shame, all of the things Jacob thought might happen if he gets caught. His brother Esau is going to cry out. He's going to weep. He's going to be mourning. And if you like listen to the words that that Esau says um, and the pain of it, like, don't you have a blessing for me too, Dad? Where's my blessing? Don't you have anything left? Esau, for a moment, gets the pain of like the privileged situation he's been a part of, of like, Jacob's felt that kind of pain of like, where's my love? Where's my blessing? And it's when it's ripped out from under him that he's feeling that same kind of pain and that same kind of victim uh, situation. And this pain is not going to go away easily. And this situation, they're, they're, the brother relationship, the parent-child relationship, all of it is fractured in a way that is going to take something supernatural. It's going to take something uh, divine to get to any level of healing. Uh, it's the point of no return. And I think sometimes we kind of minimize things of like, because we, we, you know, grace can seem so easy and we don't want any consequences, but like there's a real pain felt in this family that is going to last for years and years. And so Esau, faced with what his brother has done, what he's lost out on, is going to have to figure out how to cope. And we'll talk next week about the coping mechanisms of Jacob and Esau. But just as a a preview, Esau is gonna cope with murderous thoughts about his brother. And that shows you the finality of you've gone too far, where he doesn't want a future, he wants to end it. And this relationship is so broken that they don't know how to heal it, to mend it, how not to go in a Cain and Abel, the the murder of brother kind of outcome. And so in the midst of this pain, I think that's the only way we can get to the parts of the story when we get to even a moment of healing later, of like how do we reflect on that people in our lives, we ourselves have had moments where we felt true, true pain. And if we're going to talk about what is it to heal, to bring together, we have to talk about what is it to heal in the midst of such ugliness. When someone has lied to your face, how do you heal from that? And so I want to 
suggest a few takeaways. One thing that we can hear from this story is we should be people who choose to bless generously. Like the scarcity mindset of I'm only going to love one son or the other, I'm only going to bless one son or the other, does not lead to a, a just, healthy family system. Of ask in your prayer time, ask in your walk of everyday life, how can I bless people more? How can I be more generous with it? How can I stop making strings attached with it? Uh, you all know the person that maybe I may help you in your family situation and you're, you're struggling, I'll give you this, but you know what I need out of this. I expect on this occasion you show up and dressed in this way and go to this, you know, whatever it is. Like we want things from people, but like what is it to just be open-handed and just choose to bless and to not give blessings that close in where there's no opportunity for somebody else to get a blessing and to get love. And so maybe whether you are a, a, a young person growing up as Esau and Jacob are trying to come into their own adulthood and come into their story, or you're nearing the, the end of days where you're like, I'm not sure when death is coming for me. There is always the opportunity to decide that day, I'm going to bless generously. Second thing, don't be coerced into doing something you know you shouldn't. And don't coerce anybody else to go down that path either. Of There's so many, well, I know that this is murky grounds, but have you thought about and walking people down paths that are not going to lead towards healing. You think Rebecca could walk up to Isaac and say, hey, I heard what you said. Maybe you might reconsider. Maybe you might think about how you want to bless Jacob too, or you could have done any route other than taking this route that's going to harm your relationships. Choose honesty. Of like, if you're trying to think, what should I do in a situation? There's going to be a chance of healing and health and like a, a way forward when you choose to be honest and truthful about the situation, about yourself, about how you're feeling, about what someone else has done, but like just be honest. And to fix reality, to have reconciliation, you've got to be truthful. And I always, I always like going to South Africa and the kind of the end of apartheid and these truth and reconciliation meetings of, in some ways you've got to be honest to fix the reality that you are living in. If we put up this, this fakeate of uh, this reality as we wished it would be, you're fixing a fake reality. Uh, but we have to be honest to go towards healing. And I know that our, our series' trajectory is not to the place of the grace and the healing, but I do think in the context of this sermon, uh, it is worth talking about the gospel good news that the finality in which this story operates, the finality of I've gone too far, I've broken this relationship, or from Isaac's perspective, I've already said my blessing, I can't take it back, that words matter and that blessing, once it's out there, is just out there. Um, you can mess things up and it have a long-lasting residual effect, but God pronounces grace and mercy and love with an eternal lasting effect that can't be broken. And what is it to like, know that you've been a Jacob or you've been a Rebecca or you've been an Isaac and withheld love or you've been an Esau and have been oblivious to your family dynamic and have kind of not seen how others are in need and to know that God looks on each of those family members and still has an opportunity of grace and mercy and love and that, that you're invited into this family story of promise and blessing for all people. Again, not just the blessing of yourself but like the blessing for all people. And so you might wonder then of like, if God is so gracious and so merciful, why should I care about doing the right thing? Like, and, and Paul will kind of talk about that in the New Testament of like, you might ask if grace abounds, why not just sin? You know, grace, grace wins. You know, if God's pronouncement of blessing is just always going to make it there and it doesn't matter how many times you mess up and it doesn't matter if you're a 30-time like first-year Christian, but like there's a, a lasting effect to sin that harms people and it matters what we do because it, 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 hurts, uh, it hurts those around us. But it also is the kind of pain that, that you see Jesus taking. Uh, that God is willing to absorb that pain and those around us absorb the pain. 
And I don't think it's by accident uh, that the author of Genesis uh, gives us the long trajectory of the effects of the story. Uh, throughout the series, we'll see the kind of short-term effects, but even longer than our series preview. Jacob, who was deceptive, who went and got a couple goats, and made a meal and wore some of those goats to trick his father about his relationship with his brother, will become an older man himself. He's going to have 12 sons. And when he chooses the same path of his dad, I'm going to favor it one son, and I'm going to give him an awesome cloak and his coat that everybody's jealous of. And the brothers are going to be jealous, and they're going to want to send their brother away into slavery, and they're going to come up with a plan of what happens if we get caught, and they come up with a plan of let's go kill a goat, take the blood, throw it on our brother's coat, and take it to dad. So when he touches and feels and smells the evidence of his, his son he loves, he assumes his son has been killed. And the, the, his own children are kind of taking part in the same kind of deception, the same kind of sin and, and dishonesty that he did. When we choose to allow ourselves to continue down a uh, path of, of sin and dishonesty, it tends to hurt us back uh, uh, later, too. You know, it's, it's not just going to hurt others. It hurts our own spirit, and then it comes back at us at some point, too. And there's a loss to not accepting God's grace and mercy and, lay, and kind of delaying it uh, because we are all losing out on living the fullness of God's kingdom, of the fullness of God's love and mercy and grace and living into a better world. So I just want to invite you to think on this week, who do I identify with in this story? Do I feel like Esau who's been betrayed or Isaac or Rebecca or Jacob? Who do I see myself as? And then I would challenge you to also see yourself from a different character as well. Because sometimes we're going to gravitate just to the character who we feel like is the better option. But think through and pray through uh, how in my relationships have I uh, experienced pain and how have I caused pain and invite yourself to think about, in the midst of that, the wonderful opportunity of God's blessing, of God's hope that is offered to each of us, each and every day. So would you join me in prayer? Lord God, you know the darkest days of each of our lives, like the moments where we've failed you the most, the moments that we're ashamed of and that we won't voice, the moments that we hide from. Lord, help us to be honest with ourselves. That has been a part of who we are and that despite of that, when we accept your love and grace and mercy, like that your love covers even those days. And Lord, when we remember the blessings that you've given us, even though we have fallen short so often, Lord, help turn our hearts to a grace and mercy to be generous with everybody around us. Help us to, to heal and to be a part of the healing of this world that you are creating even still. Lord, help us to not give up hope and the relationships that we've seen go to the edge that, that you might give us still a glimmer of what might be and how you might restore and, and heal and transform even the most broken relationships that we have. Lord, for those who have felt the pain and the harm, uh, let, let your love and peace be felt like a blanket. Let your comfort bring a healing touch to, to those who need it. For those who have been on that path and, and have not seen what their darkest days look like, we ask for a wisdom and an insight so that we might repent and that we might find uh, the fullness of your healing and your love on the other side. Lord, we thank you and we praise your name.